Let me bring in my guest now. We have with us on the program retired police sergeant with the Nashville Police Department. Melissa Pinkleton is with us and want to welcome to the show a new guest. He's an emergency dispatcher and the host of the Music City 911 podcast, Brandon Hall, joining us from Nashville as well. Brandon, welcome to you. Uh, sergeant, welcome to you. Uh, Brandon, let me begin with you, if I may, please. Um, when you think about this call how rare is it for you to receive a call from somebody who's calling 911 from another state well the way that this is actually set up uh it actually brings in a little bit differently if you call 911 it goes straight into the local agency so he would have actually had to call a non-emergency line of their police department so it's a little bit different but it does happen on occasion because of that reason that I said, you can't dial straight into 911 from another state. So it, it has happened. I've been doing my job for over 20 years and I've had multiple calls like that. Boy, that's really something. So that's how he would have had to have done that. It would have taken him a little longer. Um, Sergeant Pinkleton, tell me when, when we heard the, the 911 dispatcher talking about how officers are they're on the way to the scene there, what information do you get as a responding officer when a call comes in, let's just say an apparent suicide call like this one in this case? All we get is the information that the dispatcher relays to us. The dispatcher is speaking with the person calling in and they're taking the most pertinent information and the most important information that they think the officer needs to have so that we can be as ready as possible arriving upon scene. The last question is like, do you know if there's a weapon on the scene? And even though, I mean, you, we would always assume that there's a weapon on the scene, but of course we're, we wanna know when the dispatcher needs to ask, hey, there definitely is this, look for this, look for a knife, look for a gun. Um, and so what we're listening for is what the dispatchers were laying to us. Mm, so would that be why that question about what kind of gun was it? Was that something for your benefit? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because we need to know, you know, how many, what kind. And, and while all guns can do damage, some guns can do a lot more damage than other guns can. So that would be one of the reasons, yes. That's great to know. Um, I have so many more questions for both of you. Um, we are going to squeeze in a break uh, when we come back. Um, this case uh, we know can be very triggering uh, for many people. Um, so a little note uh, as we head to break. If you or someone you know may be dealing with any suicidal thoughts or thinking of taking your own life, there is help out there. Please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. There is someone available to help you out 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when we return from this break, we'll have more from that 911 specialist you saw on the stand. Uh, this trial, uh, we've deemed the coerced suicide trial. We'll hear her be cross-examined um, by Hayden Berkebaugh's attorney. So we'll see what that cross reveals, if anything beneficial to the defense. This is Court TV Live. Then one three. Chanley Painter in Fairfax, Virginia. And if you enjoyed our gavel to gavel coverage of Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard, check out our YouTube channel to relive every polarizing moment. Brought to you by Court TV, your front row seat to justice. for being with us on this Monday afternoon. I'm Julie Grant. We're continuing our coverage of the coerced suicide trial out of Tennessee. Defendant Hayden Berkebaugh was on trial very recently for the murder of Grace Ann Sparks. Our cameras were there for it all. And we know that even though Sparks died by suicide in 2019, Hayden Berkebaugh is facing murder charges. This is something brand new for the state of Tennessee. This is a landmark case there. We're going to pick up now where we left off right before the commercial break with that 911 specialist. The first witness up now, she's gonna be cross-examined by Berkabal's defense lawyer. My name is Keith Lamar with the PD's office since we've never met before. Okay, nice to meet you. So do you have, I, I, I know how Mr. Mays is involved, but I don't know. Do you have any um, inside control, formatting ability over what information goes into the reports? No, sir, do not. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> And so, are you aware of what, are you of what information is contained on the reports that was part of your job? Yes. Okay. And so, it's fair to say that um, there is a subfield for type of emergencies, because that's very important, correct? Right. And then there is a subfield for location, because obviously people need to know where to go. Exactly. 
And then you know what type of event they're heading to, correct? Correct. And that's so you can know who to dispatch. Correct. correct. In response to these, um, response to like for a call of a suicide, you would dispatch certain people, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And to do that, you need to know that it's a suicide, right? Right. You need to know where to go? Yes. You need to know who to send? Yes. And those are the, the information that's contained at the top of the board is what type, where to go, and who to send. Yes. Best to witness, John. Redirect. No redirect. All right, let me bring in my guests. I have two great guests on the program to help me unpack this. Joining me from Nashville, Tennessee, Brandon Hall. He is the host of the Music City 911 podcast. He's also an emergency dispatcher with 22 years experience. And we have with us retired police sergeant with the Nashville Police Department, Melissa Pankleton as well. So glad I have you both with me. Uh, Brandon, if I may, um, please. I want to ask a question that I think a lot of people think about. I, I know I personally have, and, and especially when you're watching a trial like this and a 911 call becomes such a key piece of evidence. As the dispatcher handling the call, how do you stay so calm in getting that information so fast so that someone like Sergeant Pinkleton can respond to the scene as quick as possible? A lot of this is actually just repetition. We've done this so many times over and over again that we've asked the questions. We know exactly how to how to phrase everything. We know what order to ask the questions. It's just, you know, when you start out as a dispatcher, you do have to remain calm. It's kind of new. But after years and years of doing this, which I would assume that person that was on the other line, the dispatcher there probably has as well, he just knew exactly what to ask. And it, it was just because of repetition, doing it so many times. Right, it's, it's highly impressive uh, what you both do and, and using yourselves just as examples for, for the conversation here. Sergeant Pinkleton, when you get the information related to you to then go respond to the scene, are you able to communicate directly with Brandon or is it a more general dispatch you get from someone else with your department? It's a general dispatch. So a suicide call, it would be two cars that would be dispatched, myself and another vehicle. But while we're on the way to the call, we would be getting updates from dispatch because um, as he'll tell you, they, they're gonna try and keep that person who is suicidal on the phone as long as they can and keep them on the phone until police arrive on the scene. So, but we're, co we're constantly getting updates and they're keeping them on the phone. And so that by the time, because so many things could happen from the time the call is dispatched, to the time that we actually arrive. So it's really important for us to have that communication with dispatch and, and have it up to date right up to the time that we pull into the front um, the front driveway and we go from there. It's, it's really fascinating, very impressive, and obviously can be life-saving. Um, Brandon, tell me, what are the things you think people ought to be thinking about with this call in particular. You were able to listen to it along with, with Sergeant Pinkleton, myself, and everyone at home watching. What jumped out at you with Hayden Berkabell's call, please? Kind of his, uh, I guess his demeanor, the way that he was really handling himself. Uh, someone who was in a relationship with someone who's just killed themselves, he seemed minorly frantic to me. That was one of the things that jumped out at me. It didn't seem like he was like a normal person that would just have witnessed someone that had killed himself for, let's just say, no reason at all. Like they or they that they didn't know what the reason was. Obviously, there was a lot of background before this, so the dispatcher in this wouldn't know all the backstory to it. But with something like this, there obviously was a lot of backstory and a lot leading up to that. So it it could have been more of a just as they said in the um, the criminally negligent homicide. That seems like it's a very good way of putting this because he pushed this on. He wasn't directly involved as far as, you know, had his hand on the gun, but he did certainly push it. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And and we know that. And um, we know this this trial uh, it was such a fascinating trial. I mean, we had to have our cameras there uh, to capture it all so that we could bring it to all of our viewers. and. Um, Sergeant, tell me, as you were listening to the call, we heard that portion of it toward the end where Hayden Berkabaugh kept repeating to the dispatcher how he told her not to do it, he told her not to do it. I wondered what you might have been thinking as an investigator uh, hearing those words from who would become the defendant in this case. 
Yeah, I, I think that he's just trying to basically get that in and trying to make sure that whoever answers the call and the dispatcher, oh, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. I don't know if he's trying to convince himself or if he thinks he can delete a bunch of text messages and that wouldn't have been found out. Um, but definitely him saying that over and over again, he knew, at, I believe that's because he knew he actually had prodded this and pushed this along. And and to the dispatcher's point, he I, I agree with the 911 call. He didn't come across like a normal person would calling in that their loved one or someone they're in a relationship with um, had killed themselves. And I know different people react differently, but I think he'll agree with me that there is kind of a social norm, a social medium ish ask of how people act and react to things of this nature so we are usually good dispatchers and police are usually good at picking up on hmm, something's not right here something's off mm -hmm. you almost expect a certain reaction right i mean with experience you know like brandon said earlier i mean you do get to kind of know what to expect and when somebody seems a bit off it's it's raising questions and you may um uh, like them as a suspect later on. Um, really appreciate uh, you both being on the show. Sergeant, I know you can stay with us. And Brandon, I know we have to say goodbye to you, but just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on Court TV today. We hope to have you back again soon. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me on. Take good care.